just about live here on. And I think we're hitting it now. Hey, hey, hey. This is Justin, hey, Justin. of Sonic Scoop here with Martins Papellis of Sonarworks for the live Q&A on making the most out of your monitoring environment. We're going to be talking about a whole lot of stuff pertinent to mixing and mastering. Uh, just a quick shout out. Uh, Sonarworks did sponsor our masterclass with Luca Predalesi. It just came out. Super cool masterclass. He started it off by showing everyone how he uses Sonarworks, specifically the uh, Sonarworks headphones. He has like a $1,500 pair of headphones. These Focal Clear Pros. I've tried them. They're gorgeous headphones, but uh, he uses Sonarworks on those, even some of the fanciest headphones you can get, and it really improves his uh, listening experience. So shout out to uh, Luca for putting on that great presentation, and big thanks to you, Martins, and Sonarworks for sponsoring that and making it free to the public. Hey, welcome. I'm glad you like it. I hope everybody who watched it uh, liked it as well. Luca has been a friend of ours for, uh, for a long time now, and he's now really putting focus on mixing on headphones as the way forward. So uh, yeah, I think that's, a, that's an interesting uh, presentation to watch. Good stuff. And we are live on the chat here. We're accepting your questions for the next half hour here. Any questions particularly you have about making the most out of your room, your speakers, speaker placement, EQ correction, uh, monitor choice. Uh, Martins is an expert in a lot of areas, but he can also give you a great sense, particularly for how sonar works should work, how you should be using it, if you should be using it. Uh, so any questions you have about Sonarworks or monitoring in general are totally, absolutely fair game for this. I see some people writing in the chat already. Hey there, Will Berg. Hey there, Gimbal. Great of you guys to write in. I think we have uh, well more than a dozen people on the chat already and the numbers keep on going up there. Uh, Thanks. So good stuff. Thanks for joining us up bright and early in the morning. If you're here in the US, if you're in California time, I'm sure you're still bleary eyed. Um, but for you, where you are over in Latvia, it's uh, probably about mid late afternoon, right? Yep, it's uh, half past five p.m. here, so we're our day is already kind of turning, turning to an end. So uh, yeah. All right. Well, thanks for joining us and, and tacking this on to the end of your day. Much appreciated. Uh, while we're waiting for questions to come in from the audience, remember, guys, you can type them in live down here. Good morning, Muse. Good morning, Lido. Nice to see you guys. Um, Remember that you can type in questions there, but I'm going to start off with just some really basic questions for those of you who might not be totally familiar with Son what Sonarworks is. Let Martins describe that in his own words. So Martins, Sonarworks, long and short of it, it's EQ correction that you put on your speakers and your headphones, could potentially correct for issues in your room as well. But what makes Sonarworks different than uh, earlier past attempts at uh, EQ correction from you know decades past? All right. So in a very high level, kind of uh, the big problem that we are solving is the fact that speakers together with your room and your headphones are essentially coloring the sound, right? Every room sounds different, every speaker sounds different, every headphone sounds different. So as soon as you change your headphone or change your room, the sound that you're getting is colored by that particular environment or that particular device. And that gets into your way when you want your mixes to sound uh, clean and kind of uh, translate well to the places outside your studio. So very kind of, yes, very kind of frankly speaking, what Sonarworks does is EQ your room, your speakers and your headphones. But what makes us unique in this sense is that we actually, every time we apply a Sonarworks, uh, Sonarworks calibration to your system, we're actually driving the sound towards the same reference sound standard that we can kind of measure and that we can repeatedly achieve between different rooms, different headphones, and different individuals applying the Sonarworks software. So the secret component, if you will, lies into the method, in the method of uh, how we measure the room. So Sonarworks does a multi-point measurement around your sweet spot, and it actually locates the microphone with every measurement. So uh, that means that the user actually has a very, very simple and straightforward guidance by the measurement software that asks him to measure the exact spots around uh, where the engineer is sitting and uh, you know, mixing the song. And that enables this uh, repeatability of the tests and that enables us, uh, the software also, to see the measurements in context with one another so that it actually can learn about the environment acoustical environment, not just see some blind spots in the room, but actually see 
kind of build itself like a map of the acoustics of the room, and then it can be more intelligent about what can be calibrated and what cannot be calibrated. Beautiful. Yeah, it sounds like you've solved, I think, what are probably the two biggest problems for most people in the past getting EQ treatment up in their studio. One is the idea of a single point of measurement. Mm -hmm. A single point of measurement is not good to base your correction yeah. off of because you can move the microphone a few inches. Over here, it says you should be yeah, cutting exactly. you know, 80 dB by uh, 80 hertz by 6 dB. And over here, it says, actually, you have too much 80 hertz. So being able to take many measurements and intelligently yep. say, okay, what's the average amount we should be boosting or cutting this particular frequency? That's brilliant. And it's really exactly. hard to do without some of this um, kind of intelligence computational power under the hood that you guys bring. So that's one thing. Yep. And then the other part is the ease of doing it. So that's the other big challenge is if you know that, being able to take all those measurements yourself, crunch the numbers on what it should be, man, mm -hmm. that is mind-bogglingly difficult compared to having mm -hmm. it baked into software that does those calculations for you. So I think the two biggest problems that have been preventing EQ treatment from being realistic for most studios have been pretty much solved by SonarWorks. So uh, yeah. kudos to you guys for that. It's accessible to everyone now. So love oh, that. thanks. Uh, I think you got it exactly right. To add to your first point, uh, what's really interesting is that it actually mimics the way how we hear sound as human beings. Like, as you, meant, as you say yourself, kind of, if you move the microphone around inch by inch in the studio, the frequency response measurement that you will be getting varies dramatically. Uh, but you are, as a human being, you're not ever hearing this reality of the microphone. Your brain is actually this powerful DSP unit that's uh, integrating and calculating the sound and interpreting the world for you. So the brain actually is calculating a sort of an average of the frequency responses around you and all the kind of reflections that you get from your body. So that's kind of how, the way how our software is calculating the calibration profile mimics this uh, way how we hear things as human beings. And the other point is exactly true as well. We are really, really thinking hard basically every day to make our objective is making this uh, process as seamless and as simple and quick for the user as possible. We imagine our user as being somebody who is really more into making music and passionate about creating music and uh, willing to spend time in doing mixes, kind of producing music and actually working on the music. So we want to enable these users to get the translation issue and the kind of room tuning issue out of the way as quickly and conveniently as possible. So we're really kind of putting effort into making sure that, uh, that that's uh, how it works. Brilliant. Now we do have a, a couple of questions coming in from people in the live chat already. So I want to hit some of those uh, right away. Some of these guys have been patiently waiting with questions. The viewer account keeps on uh, going up on this. We've got uh, more than a couple dozen in rising. So it's nice to have. Thank you guys for joining. Let's hit uh, a few of these right now. Uh, SDR asks, is there a preferred loudness for your monitors to be, particularly if you're in a less than ideal acoustic space? So maybe we can answer that question two ways. Maybe the answer is the same way either way, but is there a preferred loudness level for monitoring? And does that change if you're in a less than ideal space? All right, that's a good question. Uh, it's actually very, a very interesting question. Uh, First of all, I have to say that the frequency response of your system actually does not change with loudness. So it's really kind of uh, the kind of how loud the speakers go from the point of view of what's the frequency response kind of from the calibration perspective. It doesn't really matter kind of uh, our system is tuned to kind of, uh, I mean, the system asks to be regulated at the normal conversational volume when you're doing measurements, but that has to do more with making sure that we are well above the noise floor and we're not also blasting your ears out so from the measurement, measurement and calibration perspective. Uh, it doesn't matter. It does matter though from a hearing perspective because your hearing kind of perception of different frequencies changes with level, right? There are these Flensen matching. Ah. Fletcher Munson. Yes, Fletcher Manson curves uh, that kind of characterize how people actually, uh, how your sensitivity to kind of uh, bass and high frequencies changes with the level. So that influences for sure what you are hearing. Uh, I, I don't think, I actually think kind of in the movie, in the movie world, uh, the standards for how you should tune your studio have actually been set pretty specifically by Dolby and the like. So there you actually have 
prescription. I don't know the decibels by by heart, by kind of uh, by heart, but uh, there is a certain kind of level your system is expected to be running when you're actually creating sound for movies in the yeah. music world. I don't think there is a preset standard, so there are different different people following different patterns. There are people who are really listening quiet and monitoring quiet because they want to save their hearing. There, I have seen people really blasting real loud music because they say, hey, that way I can get into the mood and into the mixing. I think the kind of uh, way to think about it is to think about the level. Like, I mean, there are two factors. So I don't think there is a straightforward answer, really. I think there are two factors that come in. One is really taking care of your hearing, because if you're into music creation, then your ears are basically your main asset all right, that you intend to use for the rest of your life. And if you're constantly day in and day out monitoring at real loud kind of 90 dB plus uh, levels, then you're probably going to hurt your hearing kind of a few years in. So saving your hearing is one aspect of this. And the other aspect of this is thinking about how loud will your listener be listening to the music when it's actually out there. And then for different music genres and uh, different types of music, that the answer might be different. I would still recommend mixing, I guess, at a normal kind of uh, conversational level mm -hmm. uh, to save your hearing. And then you can check the mix, how it sounds loud uh, from time to time. But uh, there is no kind of prescription. There is no predefined uh, standard, I think, in the music industry. That, that's very true. There absolutely is not. I have a couple of comments on this that maybe I can help with. And what you're saying is right, that what's coming out of your speakers and the way it's going to be colored by the room is not going to change with loudness. That's going to be pretty mm -hmm. much proportional. However, yep. just like you said, as you go up louder, you start to hear bass frequencies, for instance, more readily at 85 dB than you would at 65 dB. Because of the Fletcher Munson curve, as things get louder, we hear proportionately more bass. As things get quieter, we hear proportionately more mid-range. So when you turn up things louder, it's not that you're getting more bass coming off of the walls or something. It's that at that louder level, your ears can hear the bass better. So now any flaws in the low end become more obvious uh, to you because the amount of bass you're hearing relative to mid-range has risen as the level has risen. Does that sound like a fairly accurate way of putting it? Yes, I would, uh, I would agree. The other thing, I mean, but uh, hearing more detail as bass becomes perceivably louder is one thing, but the other thing is when you're doing the mix, then your objective is to actually balance the bass, the mids and the highs exactly the way how you imagine it as the person creating this kind of piece of art, this piece of music, right? Yeah. And the perception of the frequency, kind of the relative loudness of the frequency changes with the level of the system, which is kind of if you're really monitoring loud, you're probably going to put less bass and less high frequency content into the file if you're monitoring real quiet, right? Uh, so you kind of have to be aware of this phenomenon and think about the end listener, I guess, and uh, the level at which you're expecting that end listener to listen to the music. Right. And I, I'll tell you, I'll give you a little thing. I, like you said, there's no standard in music. All of these things have been standardized to a degree in the film world uh, where you're looking for peaks. You know, you don't want to get louder than, say, 85 dB for a prolonged period of time, that kind of thing. And there's thresholds we're trying to keep them in. I was given a great tip by the guy who really taught me mastering, Joe Lambert. And uh, he learned it from a guy who'd been doing it for decades, Carl Rawati. Both of them worked on a tremendous number of major records. And the way that... Um, Joe taught it to me is that he was always shooting for something like 80 or 81 dB. And you'd have a uh, SPL meter right there on the mastering console. You can use your phone. There are SPL meters you can get for your phone. Um, you can put that on uh, your console. And he'd be basically moving the monitor knob until he was hearing 80 or 81 dB. And he always wanted to hear around that same level because he knew how the bass should feel at that level. And if all of a sudden he started listening at 77 dB, the bass doesn't feel the same way physically. So to get in tune with the room, he would make sure he's always listening at that consistent level. Now this is mastering specific that he'd be listening at something like 80 or 81 dB. Um, I, being the young gun that I was, would monitor a little louder, 82 or 83 dB, but as I age, it'll probably go down. Um, so having, at least for the mastering context, having a fixed level, and the interesting thing is you would possibly move your volume knob to get there because some records want to be quieter than others. So mm -hmm. if you're pushing a record super loud, 
he'd still want to hear that super loud record at 80 or 81 dB because that's where his body was in tune to the, uh, you know, the bass in the room. So if it was a super loud record that he was crushing, he'd turn down the, the output level a little bit so he's listening at 80 or 81 dB. If there's a jazz record and you're not crushing it to death, he'd be turning up that volume uh, knob so he'd consistently mm -hmm. be listening at 80 or 81 dB. Now, that level is appropriate for mastering. A lot of mastering engineers will pick a level somewhere, say, between 78 and 82 dB. But for mixing, a lot of people prefer wider, like you said, conversational levels. I don't mm -hmm. know what you would consider a conversational level, Martins. I would say somewhere between 55 and 70 dB, like 60, 65. What do you consider a conversational level as a rough uh, range? I would probably range around 70 kind of on the on the louder level of the conversational kind of uh, volume but yeah right. so let's say 60 to 70 something like that could be good potentially for mixing and potentially if you are in a room where you're more worried about the the bass that lower level is going to have less amped up bass and also people a lot of people find that they can work longer and make better mix decisions at those lower levels mm -hmm. and like you said save your hearing for a long long time so those are some ideas. Like you said, there's no standard, but those are probably some good guidelines. And mm -hmm. um, having a consistent level that you mix at, just like having a consistent level that you master at is important. And a lot of people, I think, will use their dim switch. So they'll pre-program two levels. You hit your mm -hmm. dim switch, and now you're listening at 65 dB. You take your dim switch off, you're listening at 80 dB. And you have those two levels you go back and forth between. So you know how things feel at this quiet level that you keep on always monitoring at. And you know how things feel at this louder level that you can somewhat regularly check at. And I find those appear to be best practices. Uh, yeah. All right, we got more questions here. Let's get them. I, I hope we're not taking right. too long on any one of your questions, but that was a really good one and one that doesn't have uh, super clear answers. So I really appreciate it. Nathan Brown asks, is there a way of using Sonarworks with your DAW without having to turn them on and off every time you're printing your song? Or will that be introduced into the software? I can think of a quick workaround for this in Pro Tools, but I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to let Martin's uh, field this one. Yes. So uh, that is actually, I think, uh, the biggest inconvenience that we are uh, thinking hard of how to solve the fact that you actually have to turn off Sonarworks when you're rendering your song. And there are several ways how you can overcome it. One is in the DAW environment. I think the best way is to actually set up two separate outputs of the DAW so that your rendering path is different from your monitoring path. And in different DAWs, there are different ways how to do that. Like in Pro Tools, there are buses, and in other, there are, uh, in other software, there are other ways how to do that. But basically, in every major DAW, you can uh, pretty conveniently set up two outputs. And in that way, you can put Sonarworks only on the monitoring path, and uh, you can render through the other path where you're always sure that you don't forget to turn it off. Uh, and the other kind of big direction is, uh, the other big direction is using the system-wide, but that actually works only with the simpler setups because it currently works only as two stereo outputs and no inputs. So if you're working in a relatively simple home studio environment and you only need kind of two audio outputs and you're okay with some uh, kind of uh, with some latency, then you can just route your DAW through Sonarworks system-wide solution and then to your physical output. And in that way, you don't even have to bring it inside the DAW. But as I said, it doesn't kind of really work well for all the studio setups. And uh, oftentimes you'll find that you need the plugin. Right, yeah. If you do have two separate hardware outputs, uh, that is probably the most convenient way uh, that I would imagine that you just described in the beginning there, like in Pro Tools, assuming mm -hmm. you have more than one output your um, one output path is the mix and one output path is what you're monitoring. Um, but that said, I really don't think it's that hard to hit like command click or command control click on Sonarworks right before you print. That's my- I think the kind of biggest, the biggest thing I kind of understand, forgetting. it's not hard, it's just forgetting it because you have to keep track of so many things when you're doing the mix and kind of you just, yeah, sometimes yeah. forget and that's- But with that said, there's so many things you have to keep track of when you bounce, when you go, you know, file, bounce, or track, export, or however it is on your DAW, there's so many boxes you have to click or you have to double check. Am I putting this out 44.1? Am I putting it out 16 or bit or 24 bit? Am I turning on or off dithering? Am I naming the file? And it just becomes one of those additional clicks. 
Now, yes, it would be ideal if it was right there in that dialogue window that popped up and there was a box built into DAWs that said, mm. turn off SonarWorks. And hey, who, who knows? Maybe great DAWs. Actually, we, actually, we, actually have this, we actually have this feature. It doesn't work with all DAWs, but it works with some uh, where you can ask our plugin to actually warn you that if it kind of learns from the DAW that you're rendering right now, then it reminds you that, hey, I'm here, maybe you want to turn me off. But kind of it doesn't work with all the DAWs, yeah. so uh, there I, is this option. I could see in some of those more forward-looking, um, you know, ones who implement a lot, maybe you have a conversation with, say, the guys from Steinberg, like Cubase, they would be, mm -hmm. they're so fast about implementing stuff. I could imagine them writing in code that would just add to the dialogue a checkbox that says, you know, turn on or off this particular class of plugins. And that class of plugins mm -hmm. is, you know, monitoring plugins. So I can imagine mm -hmm. that being a solution in the future. Uh, but for mm -hmm. right now, yes, yep. having either two paths or um, having the, uh, just turning it off right before probably the two uh, easiest. All right, let's yep. keep on going through. Here's another great question from Lido Rodriguez. I'm going to I ask this question and I'm going to uh, pop away from the screen for just a moment because I'm going to turn off a fan here that I realize I have going on in the background. So apologies right. if there's extra noise. But I'll let you start fielding the question. Lito Rodriguez asks, what are some ideas for practicing our listening skills and ear training that will improve our monitoring of recordings? So not just upgrading the hardware with software, but upgrading the software that's in here, uh, exercises or resources for practicing your listening skills and ear training. Yes, uh, that's a very good question. We actually, uh, I don't know kind of, uh, I'm at, the, at this moment, I'm not very well aware about what are the current kind of tools and games out there that are training this. I know that we did a fun experiment at some point and uh, I can uh, later look up the exact, uh, the exact uh, web address to that, but we created this thing called Match the Mix, which Ooh. is like an online game that kind of asks you to match the uh, EQ to the sound that is being played. And so it kind of trains you to think about, it basically kind of checks how well are you able to figure out which frequency is being changed in the test file that you are listening to and uh, kind of guess it with an uh, equalizer on the game. So we have this uh, game that you can use yourself uh, to kind of uh, check your score and kind of compete with your friends. I can uh, I can definitely look up the uh, web link. It found should it. be. I just put it in the chat box down Perfect. there. It is Perfect. It is matchthemix.sonarworks.com. Matchthemix.sonarworks.com, and you can try some of those exercises right in there. Uh, another one I will shout out to a premium product. Some friends of ours, the Pro Audio Files. They have a product called Quiz Tones. It's an app you can get from yes. your laptop yes. or your yes. phone, mm -hmm. and that's a great one that a lot of people seem to enjoy. Uh, test your, uh, you know ability to hear different frequency ranges as well as uh, other things. So uh, you check out Quiz Tones too, but this free game, Match the Mix. I remember playing this actually, I think when it came out, matchthemix.sonarworks.com. A lot of fun. Uh, another great one that I want to throw out there is something called mp3ornot.com. I hope it still works. I haven't been there for a little while, but they play you, uh, technically they play you two mp3s, a 320 kilobits per second mp3, which uh, in blind listening tests, not even golden engineer, eared engineers have been able to tell apart with any consistency from uh, any full resolution. They play you one of those versus uh, 128 kilobits per second MP3. And mm -hmm. you have to tell which is which. And I have to admit, I can get it right. They have like, um, you know, six samples up there and I can get it right, you know, 10 out of 10 all day long. But I have to admit, it's super subtle uh, these days. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid first, you know, downloading music off of Napster and feeling justified for stealing music from my favorite artist, which is terrible. Yeah. And I'm ashamed of now. Back then, MP3 sounded terrible. And there would be this garbage sure. book on top of everything. And even 128 kilobits per second MP3s didn't sound that good. But now yeah. with how far the coding has come, super subtle. And it's almost like just listening for a subtle high frequency roll off, um, mm -hmm. very high frequency. So that's another fun one. But there was a, I remember, I think there was a, a thing called Sound Gym as well. Sound that's gym. also kind of, yeah. I'll type that in there too. Uh, that also does uh, kind of provide you with opportunities to train your ears and. Uh, gotcha. Good stuff. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of resources out there. And the last thing I throw out there is you can make your own using an ABX tester. Um, so you could load up any two sound clips that you want and test them. There are some, uh, I think there's some one called ABX tester for Mac. There's options for PC, but if you look up that idea of an ABX, I'll type that in here to the chat too. Um, 
you can kind of create your own A-B listening tests and uh, randomize them so you don't know which is which. Hey, one of these is flat and one of these is the MP3. One of these has, you know, uh, a sustain, uh, um, an RT60 time of two seconds on the reverb and one has 1.5 seconds on the reverb. Can you hear the difference? One has the pre-delay, one doesn't, that kind of thing. Um, so those are things that you could test um, uh, for yourself loading up your own sound samples. All right, next question. Let me uh, get back up here. That was from Lito Rodriguez. Here's the next one, Paul Cook. I don't know if Martins is gonna feel comfortable answering this one. Maybe he will, let's see. I need a pair of monitors in about the $400 range. What do you think? Can you make endorsements? Are you guys work with so many speaker companies? Uh, Are there any- We actually kind of, we're friends with different speaker companies. And honestly, I haven't kind of uh, lately been really uh, doing critical listening of different speakers in that, uh, in that speaker range. So at this moment in time, I would honestly shy away uh, from giving any recommendations. Okay. I will uh, give you some of mine. Um, the one that I'm going to give you, um, let me see under 400, I'm, I'm going to see if any others come up, um, that are worth talking about, but my favorites for under 400 for a pair, it would probably be easy for me to say the Cali audio LP sixes. Um, they are, uh, you know, full disclosure sponsors of Sonic scoop. Um, but they're sponsored Sonic Scoop because I like their stuff. We don't really let anyone sponsor <laughs> with stuff we don't like. Um, so the Cali Audio stuff is really phenomenal. Um, I, I have a pair of their IN8s actually right here in the studio with me, along with other, like a ton of monitors in here. But one of them that I have is the IN8s, um, and those are a lot more than 400, but they're really remarkably good. Uh, some of the best speakers in the 1,000 and under price range. And in the 400 and under, those Cali Audio LP6s are, are really good. Um, if you want something that's a little less neutral than the LP6s, um, some people also like the KRKs, their Rocket Series. They have ones that you could probably get for under 400 a pair, uh, as well as maybe there are some Yamahas um, that could maybe be under 400 for a pair. Um, those, the Yamahas in particular, may be a little bright for my ears, but some people absolutely love them. And I know people doing great mix work on relatively inexpensive Yamaha speakers, even though they don't speak to me. The biggest thing I think is go out there and try a few um, and see what you like. A uh, big word of caution I will give you is if you're not using something like Sonarworks, your mixes will tend to sound to a degree like the inverse of your speakers. So if you're putting out mixes that are way too dark because you really like dark sounds, then don't get really dark. Uh, then I'm sorry, then get really darker speakers. Um, if you are, your mixes are too bright because you like to hear things bright, then maybe get brighter sounding speakers. Because if you want mixes that are a little darker, brighter speakers will lead you that, in that direction and vice versa. Now, however, once you're putting something like Sonarworks on your system, that becomes less of a concern because they really are making the, the, the profile of the speaker so much more flat. And the ideal is to be as close to neutral as possible. And that's what Sonarworks will help you do. But I still do recommend starting from a baseline that's appropriate for you. And a, a big thing to remember is going for speakers that compensate for your biases. Me, I like dark, rich sounds. If I'm on very bright speakers, my mixes can sound very muddy. So if I am on slightly darker speakers, I'm less inclined to make them too dark and too muddy. So those are some of my thoughts. Here are some things. Don't just take my advice for what are good speakers, but I think those Cali's are potentially a good uh, starting point in that price range. Any additional if can, thoughts if, on speaker selection? If, yes, if I can add to what you're saying is actually in some of the, uh, I mean, we really have done measurements of this. So if you measure speakers out of the box as they kind of uh, in an anechoic chamber, right? Then the studio monitors within a decent price range of say, starting with uh, 400 and up to like $2,000 a pair or something like that kind of, they actually kind of nowadays come fairly neutral out of the box. They're not ideally flat, but they're actually kind of within plus minus three dB kind of boundaries or something like that. But what really changes what you're hearing is the room and kind of, uh, so we have these, I have these slides where we have uh, a number of speakers frequency response measurements placed on a single chart in an anechoic chamber. And that's a rel relatively narrow boundary. And then we have like one particular pair of speakers that we've taken to five different studios where people actually mix sound. And the gap is like 10 dB. So kind of the room really is 80% of the frequency response that you're hearing. I mean, there are other parameters that characterize the sound and goodness of the speaker. So kind of uh, there still it makes sense to hear and uh, make a choice of what you're buying. But uh, as 
far as it comes to frequency response, I would really recommend calibrating the speakers because that then removes kind of all the biases and all the coloration from the sound and you can just rely on the reference sound. Yes, I'd love to find that link for you now. I'm looking it up, but I remember being blown away when I saw that blog post that you guys shared. It has some graphs that are really amazing where like Martin said, they I forget if it was like six or 10 different speakers that you guys had the mm -hmm. factory measurements for, um, mm -hmm. but then you measured them in a room and the dramatic impact that the room had compared to the speakers that you could see on that chart. It was just absolute, mm -hmm. huge, huge difference. So I've said this before, I'll say it again. You'd always rather have a $400 pair of speakers in a well-treated room than a $4,000 pair of speakers in a gymnasium, right? Yep, Everyone exactly, exactly, exactly. And, and it, th that's true at a smaller scale too. In your own room, like if you have a room with no EQ correction and no room treatment on the walls, it would be better to buy a slightly less expensive pair of speakers and put some money into the EQ correction in the room treatment rather than mm -hmm. putting it all into your speakers. Mm -hmm. and because room. at the end of the day, kind of the room is a very kind of crucial part of your speaker system effectively. So kind of uh, you, your room is effectively part of your speaker. So kind of uh, I've, we, we've literally had stories where we go see some uh, friends and do a demo of SonarWorks and we've gone like, we put on a SonarWorks on the system and the guy goes, Oh my God, I was all the time thinking that my $4,000 speakers are no good and that's why my mixes turn up wrong and I should sell those and sell some other my gear and kind of get some $10,000 speakers. And now we just put SonarWorks on it and kind of, oh my God, you've solved all my problems. So I don't have to do that anymore. So why uh, do we spend all of this time and energy? Why do our minds first go to upgrading a piece of hardware gear before anything else? I, I would say so many times the best things to upgrade are the software in your head by learning yeah. new skills. And yeah. also in many times, the software in your computer is something like SonarWorks or a new plugin that'll allow you to do something you couldn't do before. Those kinds of things, things that allow you to do new things and uh, things like acoustic treatment, things like EQ correction, things like uh, you know tutorials and stuff, things like ear training, like we were talking about, man, how much of an impact those could make. And don't get me wrong. I love me some four or $5,000 speakers, but sure. they're the ice on the cake once you get everything else right. And a big thing that we talked about in our podcast episode together was like the law of diminishing returns and looking for where your diminishing mm -hmm. returns are. And I think uh, Zane Knight asked a question that dovetails nicely into this that maybe we can address quickly to tie this idea into a little bow. He says, is sonar work something that can be as helpful with lower end equipment or should you own higher end monitors for it to be effective? And I think no, this dovetails very nicely in here. Yes. Well, no, you don't have to own higher end equipment. Yes, it can be helpful with lower end equipment. If anything, you might benefit from it even more if you have less expensive speakers in a less well-treated room. You're going to get probably an even bigger bang for the buck there than if you have super nice speakers in a well-treated room, although it can make a difference there as well. What, what are your thoughts on using solar uh, works with low end equipment versus high end equipment? I mean, kind of for any given room situation, I think SonarWorks is going to be your best price performance improvement into that situation. If you're starting with a perfect room and kind of some really nice expensive speakers, then SonarWorks is going to kind of still add some things that you're still kind of unhappy about and improve the few things that you're hunting after. And that's probably going to be the cheapest way to do that because the alternative at that point is just kind of rebuilding your whole room or kind of bringing in some crazy level of uh, room treatment. And if you're still kind of at a very entry level uh, speaker system, then SonarWorks is probably going to kind of give you a huge improvement into what you're hearing, but still you're probably not going to reach the things that you can with like a well-treated room and a pair of expensive speakers. So for any given situation, SonarWorks I think is kind of a very uh, good first step. I mean, unless you're really sitting in a glass cube. So in that, can, in that case, kind of start with, uh, start with treating the room, don't invest into SonarWorks. Room treatment is still the right way to do things. But if you're in any half a decent environment with any half a decent pair of speakers, I would say SonarWorks is your kind of best first step and it can actually help you navigate your way forward because you can get a consistent system of measurement. You can measure the frequency response of your setup and then start figuring out what you should change about the room and how to improve it and how to get it as flat as possible before SonarWorks even touches it. So. Right. And I love what you say about price to performance too, because 
being realistic to get into a pair of speakers that are going to be considered generally professional quality, you're probably spending something like a thousand dollars, maybe a thousand to 1500 to get what most people can consider professional quality studio monitors where they wouldn't be a week link in your studio. Can you do great mixes on less expensive speakers? Yes, but that's like professional standard starts around a thousand to $1,500 probably arguably for mm -hmm. room treatment, doing an appropriate amount of room treatment. I would say again, in an average size room, you know, not crazy big room, room like mine here, um, probably a thousand to $2,000 in acoustic treatment you can probably get to a place where the room isn't the weakest link. And, you know, this is assuming you're buying all the stuff, not, uh, you know, having a pre-made maybe again, in that thousand to $1,500, you're starting to get to a place where you've made some serious improvements in the room, but sonar works for literally like a few hundred dollars. You're getting what would be a professional standard in EQ treatment. So you're mm -hmm. getting to that level of being at professional standard level for like a third or a fifth of the cost that you would be for speakers or for, um, acoustic treatment. Like you have to spend a lot more in speakers and acoustic mm -hmm. treatment to get to professional standard for sonar works. You buy sonar works, you're at basically professional. Fully, fully, fully with you. And I would say that as soon as you kind of get to that kind of base level of say thousand to 1500 in your investment in your speakers and the same amount in your room, right? Above that, investing into upgrading your speakers or investing into upgrading your room is really starting to hit diminishing returns. You're going to invest kind of a lot more to get a lot less back. Yes. And kind of, uh, so from that level on, I would say still kind of, yeah, Sonarworks will give you kind of the biggest leap into, uh, into what you're hearing. Yeah, if you have $1,500 speakers and $2,000 in acoustic treatment, adding another $300, $400 in either of those categories isn't gonna yeah. do a whole lot, but adding a few hundred dollars in Sonarworks is going to do a whole lot. So uh, mm -hmm. great point. Okay, uh, let's move on to some other questions from folks here. Here's one. I think we could, this can be answered quickly, but le let me know if you think differently. Will Berg asks, is it ideal to use a transparent preamp when doing calibration? I have only a 1073 Neve style preamp. Does that affect the results in some way, like a bump in the low mids that's not a result of the room? Uh, yes, absolutely. Kind of, uh, you have to use a transparent neutral preamp. So I wouldn't recommend really using any of the preamps that are designed for instruments or voice microphones to kind of add some warmth or kind of other effects. Uh, kind of the clean line in XLR input of your kind of uh, standard audio interface is uh, what, you should be, uh, what you should be after because we haven't, I mean, as soon as you have a preamp that's adding some coloration to the sound that's going to factor in into the measurement and your measurement is not going to be neutral and the calibration is only going to be as good as the measurement, right? So that's why you have to use a measurement microphone and that's why you have to really use a clean kind of uh, uh, sound um, now, Martin, line from the mic to the, uh, to the system. Yeah, your answer is actually a little bit different than I was expecting because for me, here's how I would answer it. it and that yes, if you're in an, uh, your ideal situation is the most neutral microphone and the most neutral preamp possible. Mm -hmm. With that said, when it comes to frequency response, I don't know if a Neve 1073 is actually that far off from flat. Like it's very easy to make electronic circuits pretty flat. Um, and usually the, the, the issues with electronic circuits tend to be things like harmonic distortion and noise would tend mm -hmm. to be greater issues. So is a Neve 1073 preamp going to be off by as much as a dB anywhere? And I'd think that Probably not. I'd have to test a bunch, but um, th this is just me thinking out loud on this issue. I'd love to see fr fr frequency graphs of these, um, but a particularly like a modern 1073 style preamp, I think two things happen. One, when people actually start doing blind listening tests on preamps where they don't know which is which and they're level matched, they perceive much smaller differences than they expect between preamps. In sighted tests, they say, wow, this 1073, it sounds so round and this API, it sounds so fast and, and clean. And they do, and if you have very well-trained ears, you can probably decipher that thing, maybe in a blind, a double-blind listening test. But I've seen a lot of people try those kinds of double-blind listening tests and not tell them apart because they are really so close and it really does take a, like preamps are not as big of a deal maybe as they're marketed mm. to be. Not that they don't sound different, they can and do. Not that they can't be identified, they, they, they can with effort and if you're skilled, but they're not like these big night and day differences that people expect. And I'd wager to guess that, I guess what I would say is like, I wouldn't have let having only a 1073 style preamp stop you from using Sonarworks. 
I would say that if you have the ability to have a 1073 preamp in your room, you're probably resourceful enough that you can, at least for a day, get an even flatter one so you can do the test. Mm -hmm. But I also don't think it's the end of the world because again, the biggest differences in electronic circuits tend to be not the frequency response as much as just noise and uh, transient response and uh, total harmonic distortion, those kinds of things. Do you think I'm off on this stuff? Or uh, I'm kind of, I mean, I get your point and I agree to a certain extent, just that I'm kind of, let's put it that way, kind of, if you don't have a kind of straight, clean kind of uh, preamp, then kind of proceed with caution because I mean, sure, kind of most probably what you're saying is right, but then there are all these other kind of uh, things that this preamp is introducing to the sound and then it might get kind of somehow affecting the measurement. Sure. So it's just kind of a, as an official recommendation, I would kind of uh, say that, hey, it's best to use a kind of straightforward, clean preamp with no kind of uh, voicing or kind of legends behind how it sounds. If you really don't have one, then kind of, uh, sure, kind of uh, go ahead and try the preamp that you have, yeah. but kind of be, be careful about that. Yeah, and, and if you're concerned about it, you can out. buy a preamp, uh, a clean preamp, absurdly cheap. They're actually sure. easier and less expensive to make than these colored preamps in a lot of ways because yeah. they don't have transformers <laughs> and all that stuff. So you yeah. get a clean preamp, stupid cheap. Also, if you have a friend who has a stupid cheap preamp, I'm sure they would love to borrow your 1073 for a day in return for you <laughs> borrowing their, you know, whatever yeah. cheap M audio interface for a day or whatever it is. All right, let's uh, keep on going to, new, uh, to some more questions. Um, we've already gone about 45 minutes here almost. Martins, I really appreciate the time. We advertise this being a 30 minute Q&A, but you just give such good, thorough, nuanced answers that it's hard. Uh, let's see if we can go uh, in lightning round. I wanna see if we can cut this off, hopefully uh, by 1130, because I don't wanna keep you up all day. I know you have other calls and things to do and it's near the end of the day there. Uh, Ray Manuel Music asks, um, what's the best way to use SonarWorks when you have multiple sets of monitors? This is a good one. What's the, and what's the least amount of acoustic treatment required of SonarWorks to get me 85 to 90% of the way there while working in a multi-use room? So maybe a person who's working in a room that's not just a studio, so they don't want to go crazy with acoustic treatment. They want to do enough. So he has two questions. Mm -hmm. Best way to use SonarWorks, multiple sets of monitors, and what's mm -hmm. the least amount of acoustic treatment I can do if uh, I'm in a room that I can't just totally do out? Sure. So uh, the first question is, uh, I guess, easy. I mean, let's take a step back and think of why do you have multiple sets of monitors in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the time when people actually end up having like three, four, five sets of monitors in their studios is just because they don't trust any particular one of those and they won't have multiple kind of references to check their mix on, right? So in that scenario, I would say that the uh, uh, I would say that calibrate your main pair of monitors because that's kind of your main working machine. It doesn't. I mean, how I see it, it doesn't really make sense to calibrate like all five pairs of your monitors because then what you will find is that they start sounding frequency response wise really, really similar to each other to the point where it loses sense of having all of them. So kind of uh, I would say calibrate your main monitors that you love to work on most and use those as your main point of reference when you're working and uh, doing your mix and leave the rest of the monitors for uh, checking the mix on a kind of different color, kind of different frequency response to see if anything pops out if you listen it on, on a different set of speakers that's similar to like going to a car or doing a mix check. So keep them as the other references. And then over time, you might find that kind of, uh, you actually are doing a very, very good mix already on the calibrated pair of monitors and you don't really need them. So that would be my answer to the first question. I think the kind of may, only difference, I can, only exception I can think about is if you have like a near field monitoring and a far field monitoring, yep. then kind of those are a little different use cases. In that scenario, I would say calibrate both of the pairs and uh, just kind of use them accordingly. But uh, if you have multiple sure. sets of monitors because you don't really trust any one of those, then uh, kind of calibrating a pair of aura tones doesn't really make sense because they're designed specifically not to be flat. And if you're trying to push them or pull them to be flat, then kind of uh, doesn't really make uh, sense. Right. So quick question, if you were to use SonarWorks in a pair of aura tones, would it try to get you to boost the 
base below 300 by like 20 no years. i mean uh SonarWorks is smart in that sense uh kind of the software is really when once it's doing the measurements it's really then uh finding out where the roll of frequencies of those free speakers are and then it's only doing kind of a 6 db uh kind of up no more than 6 db push to the right. speaker after the roll of point so it will not try to kind of get your aura tones play a 20 hertz uh gotcha. signal <laughs> So if you were in that situation where you had a pair of bigs, you know, the, the, the big speakers and you have a pair of little speakers and they're meant to give different impressions for the sound stage and yeah. proximity and yeah. level yeah. and stuff, and you were to treat both of them with sonar works, are there any yep. special things you'd have to know about calibrating two separate speakers with sonar works? Not really. I mean, that would just take two separate rounds of measurements, obviously, and it would get two separate profiles, uh, kind of one for the far fields and one for the near fields. And then it's just a matter of how exactly you kind of set up your routing of the audio signal, whether you have like a separate kind of output path for each of those monitors or whether they're on the same path and you have to figure out how to switch the profile. But it's kind of, uh, that's already logistics uh, kind right, of right. how you set up the sound in your studio. I would imagine the two most obvious ways to do this are one, you have multiple analog outputs going to speaker switchers and um, you have, say, uh, an aux or a master bus channel, whatever it is, feeding those outputs, and each one has a, its own instance of sonar works on it, and then they each have their own profile loaded up, and then you're doing the speaker switching physically on your mm -hmm. physical device. Yeah. Or if you're doing it all the same, through the same output, you could just by muting one or the other channel. Um, that seems less convenient. Um, this would be if you had only a single set of stereo outputs and you're going to something like a Coleman line switcher that then feeds a single set of stereo outputs into multiple speakers, you would have to do a kind of double switch. You do your software switch, making sure you change the monitor path in mm -hmm. the computer and then pushing the button that would change uh, the output. So there would be two pushes that you'd have to get comfortable doing if you only had one set of outputs. But Assuming you're sophisticated enough to have two sets of speakers, you're probably sophisticated enough to have two sets of outputs, and then it becomes a much easier thing. Um, yep, great stuff exactly. there. And then this guy's second question from Ray Manuel, we'll see how many more questions we can get to. He asks, um, what's the least amount of treatment required of sonar works to get me 85 to 90% of the way there in a multi-use room? So if you only were going to do a little bit of treatment, how much treatment would it be and where would you put it and how much would you spend and all that? I mean, that's a, a little bit hard to answer kind of a question to answer specifically. I think we already touched it a little bit. I mean, if you're taking to, to extreme and you're saying, hey, I'm sitting in a glass cubicle, then I would say kind of at least get some kind of, uh, get something on your wall, get some kind of uh, padding and get kind of something to cancel those reflections. If you're already sitting in the room, I mean, I think we already covered it a little bit, Justin, with you saying that, hey, I think kind of up till like a, thousand kind of fifteen hundred dollar investment into the kind of treatment of your room is probably where you start hitting diminishing returns kind of up to that amount of investment it's probably going to kind of improve the situation mm -hmm. after that it's going to get uh, kind of uh, smaller improvements for every additional dollar but that said i think it's really kind of up to the individual to see kind of what he or she is more comfortable with. If you're kind of comfortable with treating your room, then kind of start there, put your first $500,000 into room treatment and then look into SonarWorks. If you really want software to kind of guide you, then kind of start with investing into SonarWorks and then see what the frequency response of the room is. And then as you start bringing room treatment into, you will see how the frequency response of the room changes and it will kind of show you if you're on the right path. Sure. So, I will give uh, just a quick note from my perspective on this, that if I was going to treat a room, the first place I would start with are corner mounted uh, broadband absorbers. You can see some over my shoulders and where I have the couch place, they actually don't even go all the way to the floor. I just have them there in the upper corners. And if you're to do that in all corners of your room with something like six inches, uh, when they're corner mounted, they are effective below hundred Hertz in kind of flattening things out and kind of flattening out your sweet spot to a degree. This end of the room doesn't actually seem that well treated. If I could turn this around, you'd see I have even more treatment on the front of the room um, because the next place after those people would generally recommend would be wall mounted absorbers. And you can actually see, um, you know, I have a couple here on either side. So it gets more treated towards the, the front of the room. So that would be the next step is um, maybe side reflections and potentially reflections on the side of the wall where the speakers are. And those don't have to be six inches. They could be one inch, two inch, you know, four inches, the thicker, the better. But if you want to save money, 
one inches, two inches, you know, four inches, stuff like that is fine for uh, side walls and those rear wall uh, and the, the front wall. After that, people often treat the rear, rear wall. What I have here is a diffuser absorption mix, and that's a very common thing to put in a back wall. And once you've done all of those things, then it's possible to put clouds up in the ceiling. How much or how little? I mean, it's a good question. Like I said, I would start with corners. They're out of the way in most rooms and get you the most bang for the buck on um, you, you kind of doing your low end in a cost effective way. And then finding places on the wall. One thing you can do is you can put a mirror in your sweet spot and anywhere, uh, sorry, not a mirror in your sweet spot. You sit in the sweet spot and put a mirror on the wall and anywhere where you can see your speaker on the wall is a potentially good place to put a panel because that is where a sound wave would hit the wall and bounce back uh, towards you. So that's uh, one, one trick and you don't have to do all of them, but like I said, I'd start with corners, maybe a couple up on the side walls if you can, once you've justified that, maybe a couple on the wall here. And then if you've justified that, maybe some in the back. And then, you know, if you're gonna go crazy, you can put some stuff on the ceiling. Um, so that would probably be the order of importance I'd recommend. I don't know if you have a different order of importance uh, in your mind, Martins. No, I would, uh, I would agree with what you're saying. All right, great. Uh, let's keep on going here. We keep on getting more people in this live stream as we go on. We've got more than three dozen now and it just keeps on going up. So uh, let's see if we can get to some more of these questions. Um, best way we answered that one. Uh, Paul Cook asks, does it work with Ableton? Can you use Sonarworks in Ableton? I'm going to say yes. Sure, yes. Yeah. Um, easy, he says, <laughs> he also says, I don't know what Sonarworks is. He hopefully he's figured out by now. You can rewind to the beginning of this live stream. It's an EQ correction system that works on headphones, rooms, speakers, uh, and gets you much flatter sound. So you can make much better mixed decisions. Um, uh, by the okay. way, a radical, a radical kind of comment on this previous question about how much you should invest in your room before getting a Sonarworks. Uh, Sonarworks actually also works on headphones. And I think there is more and more people who are saying, hey, I don't actually, I can skip all the room tuning and I can skip all the things about the speakers. I can just actually get myself a pair of, a decent pair of headphones and I can do a lot of my mixing, a lot of my work on headphones. And that means that basically you can work anywhere and you don't really have to worry about the room or the environment. So that's, I, I think- I have the mastered records on the go with these headphones. Yeah. and gotten results where the clients didn't know I was mastering them on the go in my headphones. And yeah. They sound exactly the same. And I hear more and more of those stories of people saying, hey, actually starting to finish on the headphones and the clients wouldn't know. And if you think about it, then most of the people who listen to music nowadays, I would say probably 80% of music content is consumed on headphones rather than on speakers anyway. So, uh, In part, headphones are way better now than they were 10 years ago, not to mention yeah. 20, 30, 40 years ago. I mean, it's, it's sure. totally another world. I know Glenn Schick now, great mastering engineer. He masters some stuff for J. Cole, you know, that is some records that people really love, but uh, hip hop stuff, rock stuff, pop stuff. He's a huge mastering engineer. I did an interview with him on the Plugin Alliance channel. He masters exclusively high-end records on headphones. Granted, he uses a $4,000 pair of headphones. I don't think you need a $4,000 pair of headphones. Although if you're mastering at the level that he is, why wouldn't you get a $4,000 pair of headphones, right? <laughs> sure. Just take that question out of the uh, equation totally. And it's so funny because when we did the interview, he's in this place in LA, it's in the middle of a like, quarantine and he's literally like in a concrete box of a room that's huge. Uh -huh. So, you know, there's a couple of complaints like, whoa, you can tell he's really only mastering on headphones because it sounds horrible in that room because right, there's so much right. echo on his voice, but he's mastering great records just in there on the headphones. So it is doable and Sonarworks is definitely going to help because although you take the room out of the equation, the trade-off with headphones is that the particularly the upper frequencies, they can be like a roller coaster. You know, you have mm -hmm. a big dip in the upper mids, but then a big boost in the high highs on one pair of headphones. You have the exact opposite in another mm -hmm. and the Sonarworks headphone correction helps with that. And you can help with it even more if you buy the headphones from Sonarworks, because then instead of it correcting for the average of that headphone model, they've measured that specific pair of headphones each ear and corrected for them precisely. Mm -hmm. So that's a, another great solution. Looking and at what's it. interesting with the headphone calibration, we really strive to get the frequency response of the headphone subjectively to sound the same way as a pair of calibrated speakers in your room. So I've done a lot of these demos and it really translates. Like if you calibrate your speakers in a decent room with Sonarworks and then you compare them to an individually calibrated pair of Sonarworks headphones, frequency response is really, really matching closely. So you can work on the headphones and then translate to the speakers and actually kind of, yeah, you get the same flat speaker sound on the headphones. 
Well, uh, great question, follow-up question here then from Everett, who asks, I've sent my headphones to you to get calibrated. Can you talk a little bit about how you calibrate them? And then someone immediately below him, Ben J, answers, it's likely done with a binaural mic playing sweeping signs through your headphones to make sure the response of the drivers on each side, what they are. I don't know. Everett asks, I sent my headphones to you. You're calibrating them. Can you tell us yeah. how you do that? I was kind of, you started the question, I was thinking kind of the question is going to be, where the hell are my headphones? <laughs> <laughs> I can just type in the customer support number there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> not pers- uh, Martin's as, uh, he's a very busy guy. He doesn't personally test each pair of headphones. He has people yeah. who do that. Who spend all time doing that for him. Uh, to answer the question though, uh, again, if we take a step back, as we started in the beginning of this conversation, talking about the speakers, the trick of calibrating speakers in the room largely lies in the way how exactly you do the speaker measurement. The same is actually true for headphones. Like if you just take a pair of headphones, take a measurement mic and start measuring it one way or the other, then you're going to get a hundred different results. And the question is going to be, so which one is the right measurement for that headphone? And if you take the kind of classical kind of uh, torso, uh, torso headphone measurement bodies that the industry is using, then they're actually designed for a different purpose. Mainly they're designed for uh, checking the kind of uh, hearing safety standards and stuff like that. So they are actually not going to give you straight out of the box uh, the right measurement if you're talking about the frequency response correction. So long answer short, we've actually kind of invested quite a bit of R&D effort into this and we've come up with some proprietary tooling and software and manual control procedures that actually kind of combine to get you that sound. But it's uh, not a kind of, uh, not anything that you can buy on the market uh, that we're using. All right. Uh, So short answer, he could tell you, but he'd have to kill you. We are continuing (laughs) to get more and more viewers here. We're up to about four dozen, Uh, about 500 people have joined us throughout this uh, stream and we've got about uh, four dozen concurrent right now. So it keeps going up. So if you don't mind, Martins, we would keep going just a little bit longer and see if we can get a few more questions in for maybe 10 more minutes. Are you okay on time? All right. Yes, I'm good. Uh, Just so many great questions uh, coming in here. Um, so Aspen Studio says, hey, said, hey, when I saw your videos on YouTube on studio monitors and sound treatment, I started right away working on fixing the room and I'm very happy with the results. I also even got Sonarworks foam pads for my monitors, big heart. So Aspen Studios approves. Okay. Um, let's see. Next person uh, here, uh, Short Life says, I started using Sonarworks Reference 4 around a month ago. I'm extremely impressed with the results. And everyone that I've let check it out has been shocked by the difference. That wasn't a question, but a very nice comment. Um, Let's keep on going here. Um, uh, Oh, do you have any plans on adding macro or MIDI support? I want to be able to switch profiles with a controller. Short answer, yes. Stay tuned. Okay, good, 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 good. Um. Let's see, another one here. What is the benefit of using a subwoofer with Sonarworks if the software is already trying to help my speaker be flat and boosting up the lows and highs to be flat? Ooh, I know the answer to this one, go for it. All right, so first of all, let's uh, kind of uh, clarify uh, that we're talking about a stereo setup that's routed, kind of that has a sub in it. So that's a stereo kind of uh, monitoring that's routed most probably through the sub. And the reason of using the sub is just to get a system that's capable of playing the kind of uh, low end of the audio material, right? Because your standard kind of studio monitors are actually not really capable of going much below like somewhere between uh, 100 and 60 Hertz. If you want to go lower, then then you really have to get a sub. Otherwise kind of Sonarworks or not, I mean, with Sonarworks, you can't make an Oratone play 20 Hertz, right? We're actually actively monitoring the measurement and making sure that the software doesn't try to push it to play 20 hertz because uh, that's a sure way of blowing the speaker. So kind of the speaker still has the physical capability of playing the low end and the subwoofer is most often the best way and the easiest way to actually get a system that's capable of playing kind of all the way down to 20 hertz. And then putting a Sonarworks on top of it just makes sure that uh, the thing, the, the sound is as flat and as neutral as possible all across the 20 hertz to the 20 kilohertz uh, range. All right. Good stuff. Uh, So yeah, I I totally get that. The big point of the sub is to extend how deep 
you can actually reproduce. Because if your speakers are not going to reproduce 40 hertz, then no amount of boosting 40 hertz is going to get them to reproduce mm -hmm. it. If yep. anything, it's just going to distort the amp on the speaker, um, yep. you know, uh, and not do anything. So you're not looking to, this is a big misconception that people get with a sub. They want to hear more bass in the room so they get a sub. You should not be thinking of a sub as an EQ boost for low end. You should be thinking of it as a low end mm -hmm. extender that allows it to yep. go deeper yep. Yep. rather exactly. than longer. Yeah. I've heard these kind of, I think the best urban legend I've heard about having a sub is that somebody had mixed and actually mastered a record just on the kind of uh, regular monitors. But while it was done, the, uh, I don't remember now which record that was about, but basically the story was that while that record was being done, some construction work with kind of uh, uh, hammering the big kind of uh, support poles for the house were being kind of hammered into the ground. And kind of uh, that translated into the recording kind of somewhere around the 20, 30 hertz range. But because the monitors didn't play that sound, they actually didn't hear it. So they didn't catch it and it got into the actual record. And then people with subs started playing that back and say, oh, well, <laughs> what <that? laughs> What's that? Wild. all right. Just a last couple uh, quick ones here. Um, Defcon Media asks, I think there could be a short answer to this one. I'd love to try this. Can a good engineer mix in a bad room? I'm going to say, Yes, they'd have to learn the room really well and they would mix better or at least faster in a good room. So it is possible that you can get a good mix out of a bad room as long as you learn that room so incredibly well and spend a lot of time doing it that you know how bad you have to make it sound in your bad room to sound good elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and that's yeah. one of the things you have to learn to do counterintuitive things and to mix to make your room sound good. Like, can you mix on a pair of Sony MDR 7506 headphones that to me sound extremely bright and brash and shrill? The answer is yes, but you have to make all of your mixes sound extremely bright and brash and shrill and know that that's how they're supposed to sound on those headphones to sound good. So something like Sonar Works and room treatment and all that stuff is going to make it easier. So you don't have to make weird decisions to make things suck, to make it sound good outside your room. You just make things sound good and they sound good. That's the way I would take it. Why do you think so? Yeah, can, can totally I agree, basically. I mean, what the really, what the really good experienced uh, engineers are basically doing is they have developed this capability to learn the room really quickly. They'll go into a new unknown room and listen to a couple of reference tracks, and then they'll basically know what's going on. And then they'll kind of put that into the back processing of their, of their brain and then kind of while they're mixed, They'll kind of take that into account, which kind of adds another layer to your thinking process while you're mixing. And then kind of with a couple of attempts, absolutely, they will be able to get a good sounding mix out of that room. But kind of A, that takes a lot of experience and kind of skill to kind of be able to quickly understand what the room is doing. And it actually takes some of the thinking power of kind of thinking while you're mixing uh, to kind of do that processing and adjustment for kind of putting things that shouldn't be there because of the room and stuff like that. So it's just kind of gets way easier and way faster when you don't have to worry about it, but it's possible. Totally. All right. And uh, anyone who was doing that and going into bad rooms could uh, figure out the room much quicker if they had sonar works to the room or did little things to make the room less bad. Uh, lightning round here. I want to let you go because I know you're a busy guy. You got other calls coming up after this. So um, lightning round for these last five minutes here. Um, Headphones, are they good enough for low end? And uh, this is Relex Max, he asks, are headphones good enough for low ends? What good headphones are good enough for low end? And can we hear 30 hertz with good headphones? Mm, yes, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, when I have to recommend the headphones, I always uh, kind of uh, end up uh, recommending Sennheiser HD 650s because they're kind of one of the flattest headphones out of the box and they have one of the widest uh, frequency response ranges. I have to say now, I don't really remember by heart all the kind of ex frequency range of the headphones, but the headphones really can go the real, real low. And I think they are good enough for mixing the low and sometimes even better than the room if you don't have a particularly good one. Yeah. And I've got to say, uh, those uh, Sennheisers come up as a recommendation so often. They are some of the flatter headphones out there. I'm going to put in a quick link here, a uh, roundup I did of all the best headphones um, uh, out there for mixing and mastering. They are definitely on there on the list. There are comparable models from Shure, from Audio-Technica, from other brands. 
Um, but the Sennheisers are pretty flat. The only problem I've had with them is that they are a little bit low end light and they don't go as deep as I like to hear. I know that Sonarworks does correct for that a little bit with the roll off. The reason I have settled for myself on these blues is I like the low frequency response on these. They're a, a semi open design and you can actually like feel low frequency below 100 hertz in a way that to me is more speaker like. So if you have a problem with low end and you don't think the Sennheisers give you enough of like feeling the low end going on, um, the blues do that in a way where the low end isn't hyped, but you get a more speaker like sense of physical response from low end, which is why I like them. They are darker on top than the Sennheisers are. So unless you like mixing on very dark headphones, they would definitely benefit from something like the uh, Sonarworks uh, acoustic tr uh, uh, reference software to, to make them a little brighter on top uh, and, and even out the high frequency response a little bit. But again, try some pairs, find some that speak to you in and of themselves that you really like and that lead you in the right direction and then add reference uh, for to them and, and make them- You can actually kind of, well, one thing that you can do actually is if you get the trial version of Sonarworks reference, which you can do for free, then, uh, <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, then you can uh, actually browse through the different headphone profiles and it will show you the frequency response of each of those headphones on the screen. So you can actually see the frequency response of the different models. So if you're trying to choose between a few pairs, then uh, that might help your decision making. All right. Uh, last question here that I think we're going to be able to get to today is a, probably a pretty easy, easy one from Isaac Verdu, who asks, are there plans to allow users to adjust the correction curve manually? Again, yes, stay tuned. <laughs> wow, all right. Now, uh, some quick thoughts on that. Pros and uh, cons to letting people do that. First of all, why have people been asking for the ability to do that? And do you see what are the potential problems of you doing that yourself? And what would be some of the mm -hmm. potential benefits once that's mm -hmm. So uh, it's actually been now a while while we have heard that people are asking for this feature. I think we've been a little resistant to put it in the roadmap because, uh, because kind of philosophically speaking, what we really want to build as a product is something that you can do the measurements, kind of apply the Sonarworks calibration, and then just be confident that what you're hearing is the right sound. And you don't have to second guess, you don't have to make too many decisions yourself. You can just rely and say, okay, this is, uh, this is the right sound. This is kind of exactly uh, kind of the best way to work. And in that scenario, as soon as you start adding some customization tools, then as a user, you can always start saying, hey, okay, I've done the measurements. But now can I really be sure there are these five knobs that I could be now fine tuning? Do I have the right setting for those five knobs? Should I kind of tune this or tune that? And then kind of it adds some worry that I would love the users not to have. And it also adds the opportunity to screw something up and then say, hmm, I put Sonarworks on, my mixes don't translate. What's a piece of uh, bad software? So kind of that, that's, I think, the thing that we are trying to avoid. Now that said, uh, I think we're now kind of, as more and more people understand the product and as more and more people are kind of aware about the benefits, then some people really want to tune the flavor uh, of the sound that they're hearing. And some people really have some specific asks that kind of uh, they need to fit their particular way of working or their particular way of kind of getting the song to translate. And I kind of think that maybe, maybe it still wasn't the right thing to put in the software first years when we came out, but now kind of when kind of the music creator community has already to some extent accepted the idea of room calibration and headphone calibration, then for that specific user group that wants to tweak the sound uh, and they seem to know what they're doing, that seems to be like uh, kind of the, the way to go. So. All right, sweet. I think that was a great last question to end it on. I want to be able to allow you to get on to your next call. Uh, Martins, thank you so much for joining us. Where should people check out Sonarworks, follow Sonarworks? Is sonarworks.com the best place or is there anything else you want to hear? Sure. And then uh, kind of from there, you will easily find the social media. We're kind of active on Twitter and no, on uh, Instagram and uh, Facebook. So, so sonarworks.com is the place to start. And we actually have a pretty great blog that uh, people oh, seem wonderful. to like. So kind of uh, take a look and uh, sign, up for, uh, sign up for the news on the blog and uh, yeah, stay tuned. And uh, we're definitely working on some great things uh, to bring yeah. to music creators. 
please do check out the SonarWorks blog. So many great posts on there about the kind of theory and practice of correcting your room speakers and headphones. They also have a lot of headphone reviews on the blogs and they do them in a really impartial kind of way where they're measuring them, talking about the uh, pros and cons. They've even given heat to one uh, headphone company that were like, oh, our headphones are too flat for needing Sonarworks. And Sonarworks is like, oh, well, let's just measure them and find out. And then they measured and found out and they weren't <laughs> Sonarworks. So I thought that was a really amusing one. And they were very tasteful and funny about it too. So uh, really well written. Absolutely check it out. Some of the uh, greatest content from a brand, I think, out there. So check out the Sonarworks blog. Check out Sonarworks. Uh, definitely uh, worthwhile stuff. Every single one of the reviewers who has reviewed Sonarworks independently for Sonic Scoop has loved that stuff. I don't review them because I uh, like their stuff and they sponsor and um, I'm totally not impartial at all. But when we get third party impartial reviewers, they're always blown away. So I uh, hope you guys enjoy it. Also check out the presentation they sponsored. I just put some links in there. Luca Predalesi, amazing electronic EDM and hip hop producer, mixer. He walks us through his approach in the MixCon Masterclass. We did a Q&A just like this with him. You can find that. I've just linked to that there as well. And you can also sign up uh, to RSVP for a few future live Q and A's and live premieres of these MixCon masterclasses at mix-con.com. That's mix-con.com. Remember to like and subscribe to the channel here, hit that notifications bell so you don't miss any more of these as they come out. Martins, thank you so much for your time today. Well, thank you, Justin. It's been a pleasure talking with you as always. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me. I hope you, I hope you, I hope you and the listeners and viewers enjoyed the conversation. Oh, there's tremendous feedback in here. We're getting a lot of uh, thanks and everything here in the comments and a bunch of comments I didn't read to you about just how much people like the product. So thanks again for uh, joining right. us, Martins. Thank you guys for hanging out with us and asking all of your questions. Hope to see you again sometime soon. This has been Justin Cloudy of Sonic Scoop. See you next thanks. time. Have a good day, everybody. Bye. All right.